Hi, welcome to the Gestalt IT Roundtable podcast. This is a discussion series featuring some of the brightest and best influencers in information technology today, discussing a variety of topics that are important to the greater IT community. My name is Tom Hollingsworth. I'm an organizer on the Tech Field Day event series, and I'm a writer for Gestalt IT. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our guests on the podcast today for the folks at home. I'm uh, Kevin Myers. I'm a co-founder of uh, IP Architects, and I blog at stubarea51.net, and I'm on Twitter at stubarea51. And uh, what I do is basically network architecture, integrating white box into traditional vendors. I'm Yvonne Sharp. I work um, as a consulting network engineer for a large uh, Fortune 500 healthcare provider. Um, You can find me on Twitter at Sharp Network, and I blog at esharp.net. I'm Eric Stover, an enterprise network engineer for a Fortune 500 company. I'm on Twitter at Eric underscore Stover. And when I do blog, it's at 12fs.wordpress.com. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it. One of the topics that's been coming up a lot recently in the networking space, especially when it comes to SDN and all things the future of networking, is the idea of white box switches. And are they going to take over the world? Are they going to replace what we consider to be traditional networking vendors? And it's great that we had all of you here available at Networking Field Day to kind of discuss this topic a little more in depth for anyone who might be interested. So, Kevin, I'd like to get your thoughts on white box switching since you kind of do it on a day-to-day basis. I mean, are you seeing a lot of displacement? Yeah, I think we are. I mean, you, you think about, you know, we, we talk about total cost of ownership and you have these, the, the CapEx and the OpEx scenario. And so when you're dealing with a traditional vendor, you know, the idea is, is white box as stable? Is it as good? Can I deploy it? Can I support it? And I think the answer is yes. I don't think we were always there, but now you have so many different vendors supporting white box and offering that support to say, here's how you get into it and here's how you make it look and feel like what you already have. So I think the support arm is there and that's what we've been waiting on to try to shift this into the enterprise. Hmm. It's an interesting point because support is usually one of the things that I hear is kind of the Achilles heel of white box. Um, Yvonne, you work for a large organization. Is support something that's important to you and your, your team for when it comes to network hardware? Uh, it's huge for us from a, a corporate decision-making standpoint. I mean, when things go wrong, leadership wants to know who, who to call. Um, you know, th- they always want to throw to choke. Mm-hmm. We talk about that a lot. And um, I think especially in an organization where you know you're going to have some turnover. You don't know that, that the people implementing the system are going to be the same people that are here three or four or five years from now. Um, that's really the big challenge in the enterprise. If you're using a, a Cisco product, everybody's familiar with that name. There's a certification path. We can go out and we can uh, ask for resumes that have CCNA on them, and we can have at least a certain level of confidence that folks have logged into and at least looked at how to configure and make that equipment work. So I think um, that is the mentality challenge that we face um, with white box switches in the enterprise. Eric, what are your thoughts about white box when it comes to the enterprise? Well, I I think I have a kind of a unique perspective among the amongst the group and that is I'm from the enterprise, a small smaller enterprise uh, and today Personally, I see the value in white box. Uh, just as Kevin mentioned, the total cost of ownership. We're looking at, you know, three-year hardware refresh, um, where it ends up being the support actually ends up costing more than the switch. So, um, if we can squeeze another two years or five years out of that and kind of equal out the cost of support and the, the cost of the actual box, I think that's important for for the enterprise is, is kind of equaling out those costs and lowering the total cost of ownership. Um, and, and then in, uh, operationally, I think white box presents some really great benefits for an organization that only has one or two network engineers where the kind of the management footprint gets reduced uh, with white box switches. So it's interesting to me that a lot of the discussion that we saw around, around white box came from the web scale guys initially. I mean, Facebook has been pushing their web switching platform very, very hard because you know they get obvious benefits out of adoption of, of that version of it. But I, uh, I had a chance to talk to Dom Wild from Hewlett Packard Enterprise um, just a couple of weeks ago, and Dom had some very interesting comments when it came to the idea of using white box switches, at least inside of HP, because you know they have a, a huge history with with their own line of pro curve switches, and then with the H3C acquisition, and they have developed their own white box line called AltoLine. And Dom said, AltoLine is great for management networks. That's the sweet spot that they're seeing white box switching. 
cheap and dumb. Do you guys think that it's white box is an all or nothing proposition? No, I don't. I don't think so. So you know, I I, I think for me, I'm coming at it from a couple different angles because I, I work in the service provider world and the enterprise world, and so we're starting to use it in both. But the thing about white box switching, I mean, here's the thing: we've always relied on the vendors to tell us what is enterprise technology, what does an enterprise design look like. We have these validated designs, and white box kind of takes that and says. Pick the protocols that you need. Pick the things that you need to solve your problem instead of saying this is enterprise, this is not. And then you could put those tools into a white box switch because you know it's got an open operating system and you can put what you want in there. And then you build what you need to solve your problem. So we're, we're attacking designs in a whole new way now with white box, whereas before it was just this is how you do this because a vendor X says so. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting point. But we're relying on, on ourselves to kind of develop those new enterprise design guidelines and things like that, which might be easier for Eric to do in a small enterprise. It's a, it's a challenge, too, for us because we don't, I mean, in, in small, you know, Fortune 700 companies, they don't have, we rely on Cisco-validated designs or network or vendor-validated designs as this is the path we need to go. We don't necessarily have an, an architect person to say, hey, we can go out and build a spine leaf, you know, this, this spine leaf topology uh, you know, from scratch, we're looking at Cisco or someone else to to have a, a validated design. For but us. see, right. Avon does have a team of architects and engineers. And do you have a plan for your entire infrastructure? Is it easy for you to re-architect it around the ideas that White Box is presenting? I mean, it's never re- easy to re-architect an environment. But there there are two levels you've got to think about, right? You've got to think about what's what's technically the best solution. What do we need to accomplish? Where what, where's our business going? What do we need to do? But then there's, there's the other layer, which is what is executive leadership com- comfortable with? What names do they know? And I think for, in the enterprise, that's the biggest challenge with things like white box switches because those of us with boots on the ground can be very comfortable with the technology. But uh, the, the mixing and matching and the we can do this and the we can do that, and, and there's all this cool stuff. I mean, when, when we start talking that way to executive leadership, that's just not comforting to them. <laughs> that's scary. Um, and I think the challenge is how do we build a comfort level with white box, which is to say, yeah, this is sturdy, it's solid. You know, I've not got some cowboy in my data center who's building something that nobody else can come in and support. Because I think in, in the enterprise, that's the biggest question is, is what's the longevity I can get out of it? And how do I support it if, uh, if the person who built it gets hit by a truck? And that's where I think, going back to the support discussion, is I think that the you know not to name certain vendors, but like just in general, the, the vendors in the space that are doing the operating systems that go on the switches have come a long way, and I've started to do a lot of interaction with them, like on design, and like they get where companies are coming from. Like this is what you had, this is what you ran on, and they'll you know start working with you to get a design to say this is what this would look like if you do it with this, and this is how you integrate. And so they're really trying to be cognizant of that, that you, you're used to having a Cisco-validated design and you need a, I get from A to B this way. Right. And that's, that's the play they think they're making, and it's data center right now, but, I mean, really, we see this all the way to the enterprise edge. You know, I see one day you're going to have a pair of white box switches and a hypervisor at a branch, and that's, that's all you're going to have, you know? And I think it's interesting that, that we keep talking about the fact that, you know, Yvonne works in a large organization where um, management is hesitant to implement a solution they're not comfortable with. You know, small enterprises, they have their designs that they need to stick to from reputable, well-established vendors. But the fact is, is that some of the white box solutions that we're implementing from companies like Acton and Quanta, you don't know the name, but you know the device because somebody else ordered it from an ODM and stuck a sticker on it. Would it be easier to adopt these if we started doing things like Edge Core Networks is doing, where they're not selling you an Edge Core switch they're selling you a Facebook switch because Facebook had the design and they're giving it to you. Do you think that that name recognition from someone that obviously knows how to build a network will help increase white box, white box adoption? I think absolutely. I've actually used that argument in sitting in organizations like Yvonne's because I consult for the Fortune 500. And so you sit in there with the decision makers and say, you know, well, why should I do this? You know, why? I, I get the CapEx savings, but how much is it going to cost me and my OpEx and support? And you say, well, this is, you know... Google is doing this. Facebook is doing this. And obviously, we're not those people, but it can be done. Somebody said, this can support a critical environment, and it can do it, and you can still save money. And that was the problem that we're trying to solve and then support it. And so I think that resonates with IT leadership and a lot of organizations. And like Yvonne said, they're not ready to jump in with both feet yet. They want it. They want the cost savings, but they're still trying to evaluate 
you know, is this going to be the right decision? So there's still still some work there to do. One of the one of the things that I think of that's analogous, and you guys can correct me if this is incorrect, but if we look at Linux adoption in the enterprise, it was a very similar proposition, right? Your technologists knew it was a solid technology. Yeah, that's an excellent point. But then you have somebody like uh, Red Hat Enterprise who comes along, and they provide an enterprise support model and a validated. Uh, version of Linux that they can guarantee on this hardware is going to run and will support it. I think that is is the path forward for white box in the enterprise, just because it provides a comfort. It's level. all about the lifeline. It's it's like you know I'm, I can do this. I see this. You guys support this, and I, as long as I can call somebody to get that help, then I can sell this and say yes, we can support this, and we've got a we got a lifeline to call if we've got issues. Right. So let me take one little spur off of this conversation now that you brought up Linux, because one of the things we're starting to see is a lot of low-cost white box vendors are beginning to introduce Linux offerings. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but today Cumulus Linux announced that they're going to start making hardware. Cumulus is known as a network operating system vendor, but now they're going to start making hardware and offering it as a white box solution. Do you think that the Linux adoption curve as you stated, when Linux got enterprise support, it became a thing, will help other people understand white box by saying, well, you know, it looks like a switch, but it runs Linux, and we know Linux works. Do you think that that could be helpful to them? Eric, what do you think? Absolutely. I mean, it's going to do nothing more than uh, to, to help that, that adoption rate. Um, if there's uh, you know, standardized, standardized builds and things that CIOs and CTOs are familiar with, and they see the, the 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 brand names, then absolutely, it's it's going to do nothing but help. Vaughn, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, it. Yeah, I don't know how much more I have to say? Yes, I do. Very good, uh, Kevin. What do you think? Um, I've got a split opinion, so I agree with Eric. But I think also some of the white box operating system manufacturers are doing the traditional CLI, so they have like some of the SDN type API things, but they still have a traditional CLI. So I think it's kind of a split because some people want that CLI and some people want Linux, so they can do the Ansible and the automation. And so I, I think there's value in both because the CLI makes it an easy transition. But you get in the Linux world and you can kind of start to do the automation thing. So yeah, I, you know, I, I think there's arguments to both. Well, I, I think one of the challenges, honestly, sometimes we make it sound too sexy, and that's scary. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I mean, because my network gear, I want it to, I want it to push packets, and I want it to do networking, and I don't, I don't want it to run an op- operating system that can also run a mail server, right? Because I mean, <laughs> I think sometimes people think that way, and so we got to be careful how we discuss the solution, so that we make sure we make it clear that this is a. It's, it's real, and it's a real deal, and it, it does an enterprise job. And I actually think that that's a very good point because white box switching is not the only company that's doing that. Large networking vendors are starting to give you the capability of doing things like running containers in the operating system on a switch because they think that that's what technologists want when realistically you know, architects and engineers and even management wants you know, networking as a utility. So you know, maybe it's time to push back on that. Well, I think the opposite of that, I think the positive side of that is you're giving you the ability to only put the protocols that you need in. So your, your, you know, your ability to catch bugs gets less. And I think it's, it maybe Dell is kind of working on that on a separate operating system. But mm-hmm. it's, if I only need, you know, I need a layer three switch. All I need is OSPF, and that's all I need. I'm going to put a stable OSPF package in and not put all these other packages into the switch because I want the maximum amount of stability. So if you're financial services or you're somebody that doesn't want all these 8,000 other features, you can pick and choose and build your most stable build. So I think there's a, a huge amount of value in that. That's Dell OS X, and they're doing yeah. the same thing that Red Hat is doing. You can either use your own modules for free, like Quanta, Quagga, or whatever, right. or you can buy their routing and switching modules, and you get full enterprise support for that. Yvonne, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, and, and I want to be clear, I mean, I think being able to run VMs and containers on a switch is a great thing. I mean, I think that's, that's where we need to go. I just think we need to be careful how we position that and not say, you know, oh, well, your switch is just going to run Linux. I, I, don't, I don't know yeah. that that's the right approach. Maybe I mean, it's it may more be for running Linux. network services. I mean, like, that's what I would see is maybe you need a network service to run alongside right. a switch. Maybe it's like a, an IPS or I don't know, some kind of network service, but we're not going to be like, you know, not running up app- servers. Enterprise applications. Yeah, well, I think that's switch. why you know, <laughs> have small hypervisors. Yeah, I think you have small hypervisors. So, like, at a branch level, I think you just have a pair of small hypervisors and, you know, a pair of switches, and I think you could do it with that. And in this room, like, we all know that a lot of our big name vendor switches and routers run Linux, mm-hmm. right? But I don't know that we need to talk about it in those terms. 
And I think that that's honestly what helped Linux adoption more than anything else is when it stopped being about Linux and just started being about an operating system that makes things work. Linux won the war but lost the public battle to, to overtake Microsoft when you think about the fact that you know, BSD and Linux run 70, 80% of the things that people use every day, whether they realize it or not. So you know, we're going to wrap up here with one last question. Um, you know, five years from now, so it's now uh, 2022, and networking has been completely obliterated as we know it. It's no longer boring, and, and it's completely unsexy again. How much of a percentage do you see enterprise adopting white box switching? Ooh, I think I, I think we're going to see at least. I want to say at least 30%, 40%. I'm not going to go forecast all the way that we're going to be all white box because, you know, enterprise is just, it's like turning the Titanic. It takes forever. So I'm going to say 30 to 40% white box penetration in five years. Vaughn, what do you think? Yeah, I, I was uh, a, a large minority was the phrase that was in my head, right? I think we'll see some of that. And I think we'll see adoption maybe in dev and uh, lower priority workloads first, mm -hmm. and then we may see it grow. But I think that's a great place to introduce it. Um, is in your your yeah your management networks, but also your dev environments. And hey, we'll play with this, but let's let's not rip out our core and put it in uh, without some really serious vetting. Eric, yeah, I, I can only agree with what Yvonne and Kevin said. Uh, I see adoption in non critical networks, labs, uh, you know, within the next five years. But you know, looking in data centers and production. Uh, you may see some of the, you know, more quick-moving enterprises adopt, but like Kevin said, you know, there's a lot of enterprises that are on five-year refresh cycles that are going to end at that time, and then, you know, I don't see them going from the, your standard, you know, fixed switch to uh, a white box switch. Well, and in our world, a five-year adoption cycle would be wonderful. I mean, most enterprises in your core data center network, it's seven to ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's not uncommon. And so that, that's one of the things that I hear a lot is, you know, if I can make this next white box switch last ten years or even longer than that, if I can make it go two refresh cycles, then that's where the real value starts coming in for me is that I'm not, you know, ripping and replacing and doing things like that. And so realistically, I think that that's, that's the positioning for white box is that white box needs to learn to coexist with existing switches and edge cases and then build from that edge into the core. And that's where the real adoption is going to happen. We've already won over the technologists. We've already won over the networking engineers. Now we have to work on winning over the people who write the checks and the people who have to answer the phone in the middle of the night when something doesn't go right. And if we can make those people happy, I promise you that white box adoption will shoot through the roof. The on-premise IT roundtable is once again brought to you by Gestalt IT home to IT coverage from across the enterprise. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Gestalt IT and at Facebook.com slash Gestalt IT. Very original. The On-Premise IT Roundtable is produced by Rich Straffolino. That's me. Until next time, from all of us here at Gestalt IT, have a super sparkly day. <laughs>